having difficulty sometimes coming up with something to talk about. And as I was looking for something to talk about this week, I looked at the world, the shape it's in, and I thought, I could really spend hours talking about what's going on wrong. And it wouldn't take long to say what's going on good in the world, but we could spend days pointing out people's mistakes, especially our government. And I got to thinking, well, how about evaluating the church? Could we look at the church and see what's going on in the church? And when I did, I found something amazing. And you all are aware of this. There's seven letters to seven churches in the book of Revelation. Now, one thing I've always found interesting in, in, in the church is the number of times something is mentioned in the Bible, we stress if something's mentioned twice, well, you ought to pay attention to that. We do that with uh, Ezekiel 18, 4 and 20, both say the soul that sins, it shall die, which of course is opposite of what most of the world's religions teach. And in Proverbs 14, 12 and 16, 25, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So these things being mentioned twice, we think are pretty important. When I looked at those seven letters over in Revelation, I found something really interesting in it. There's three things that are mentioned in all seven of those letters. And I'm sure some of you have seen that before, but I want to talk about that today. I want to see what lessons we can learn from the seven letters in Revelation. If you turn over to Revelation, we'll start in chapter one. Just to get some background, I'm going to read a little bit out of Revelation 1, starting in verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, that's us, things that must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all the things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. So the blessing is not just on those in the seven churches who the letters were addressed to, but it's everyone who reads and hears what's in this prophecy and who keeps those things which are written in it for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who, who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who before his throne. And then down in verse 11, saying, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, <clears throat> to Ephesus, to Smyrna, uh, the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. What I'd like for us to do today is look at the three things that are said seven times each to the seven churches. Because I think it's pretty important when something says seven times. So if you turn over to chapter two, and if you want to put a marker in your Bible, we would start here in chapter two of Revelation. We're going to come back to Revelation two and three several times. <clears throat> the first thing that's said to all seven of the churches is found in verse seven. Well, the first thing I want to talk about there, it's not the order that they appear in, but the first one I want to talk about is in verse 7 of Revelation 2. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So although the letters are addressed to the seven churches, it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to all the churches. Down in verse 11, the same phrase is repeated. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Down in verse 17. <clears throat> he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 29. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And in chapter 3, verse 6. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then in verse 13, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
And in verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He repeats this seven times. Well, what does it mean to have an ear to hear? I've got two ears. They don't work as good as they did when I was a lot younger. I have to wear hearing aids to, to help me sometimes. Is that what he's talking about, to be able to hear a sound? Well, I think we all know that that's not exactly what uh, Jesus is talking about here. The Greek word for hear there means to give ear, to give audience to, to understand. A uh, Greek textbook that I looked it up in gave it actually four definitions, which I think are kind of progressive if we think about it. You hear something, you hear the sound, you learn that thing, then you obey that thing, and then you understand it. And I think we've seen over the years in the church when we maybe the first time we hear uh, a new teaching or an old teaching to some people, but it's new to us. Then we learn it. We learn that to obey it. And then sometimes the understanding comes later. So let's remember that as we think about hearing today, that it's kind of progressive, the, the depth of the hearing. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 13, just to be clear about what Jesus means about he who has an ear, let him hear. Since he's the one that said that, let's go to his definition of it. Matthew chapter 13, and we'll start in verse 10. Jesus is explaining parables. <clears throat> it would help if I went to Matthew instead of John. Look down there and it wasn't what it was supposed to say. Matthew 10, or I'm sorry, 13 verse 10. And the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? Of course, I asked that question when I was 10 years old back there in the Baptist church. And I was told, well, he taught them parables because they were farmers and it helped them to understand things better. Well, we're, I hope I've learned a lot of lessons about that since then. It's not what he was saying. Verse 11, he answered and said to them, because it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So when he says, he who has an ear, remember, it's so that you, it's been given to you to understand these things. Verse 13, therefore I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In verse 16, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men do desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Didn't set my timer. I guess that means I can go as long as I want to. Right. It's a funny little story. My, my mom, she's still Baptist. A few years ago, they lost their pastor and they had a pastor come in and audition with the deacons. And, uh, he asked the deacon, he said, sometimes I get inspired in my sermon and I go quite a while. They said, is it okay if I go a long time? And one of the deacons said, pastor, he said, if you get up there and you get inspired, you can preach all afternoon if you want to. The congregation's going to leave at 12 o'clock, but you can keep preaching if you want to. <laughs> so even though I didn't set my timer out, I'll try not to go too much over time. Jesus said that he gave his disciples and those who would believe because of his disciples ears to hear. Let's turn over to John chapter 10 and read a little bit more about this. This is a fascinating section to me. I, I love what Jesus says here in John chapter 10. <clears throat> John chapter 10, and I'll start in verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Let's keep this concept of the shepherd and the sheep 
as we'll go through this today. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will not by, <clears throat> I'm sorry, but they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. He who has an ear, Christ said, let him hear. We should hear his voice in those things that we read and hear. And in verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. And then down in verse 26, he continues, But you do not believe, because you're not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So when he says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear, he's talking to his sheep. That's you and me, hopefully, each one of us realize that we're Christ's sheep. Hopefully we recognize his voice. When he talks about recognizing his voice, it always makes me think of the example of Abraham when he went through his severest trial when God said, go sacrifice Isaac. Doesn't say that Abraham hesitated or that he thought about it for a while. He knew God's voice and that's all that mattered. He didn't understand what God just told him to do, but he knew whose voice it was. We need to be that familiar with Christ's voice. We need to hear that voice, understand it, and follow him. So what he says to those seven churches applies to each and every one of us. There's some interesting thoughts about the seven churches uh, over the years. Uh, the basic meaning is there was seven churches there in uh, what's now Turkey. And the letters were to them. But there were a lot more churches around. Why those seven? I don't know why those seven were chosen. But as we read, he who has an ear, it was meant for everybody to hear what he said to those seven churches and to apply it for them. Most of us agree that the seven churches each had their own problems and he addressed each one. There was a teaching in the church at one time and still is a teaching. And some people still follow it that these are seven progressive eras of the church from the apostolic era on down to the present time we're living in now, which is the end time. And each one of those churches represent a section of that time period along the way. I haven't heard as much talk about that probably the last 35, 40 years. As was talked about the first 10 years I was in the church. Uh, one reason I think people don't talk about it as much is as you get down close to the end of time, you get down to the what's known as the Laodicean era, which is the last church. And nobody wants to say, well, we're Laodicean. But being in the Laodicean era doesn't make you a Laodicean person. It's just a time of expression. Uh, it's like ages or they're saying the, the decades well, of course it's not decades because these are sometimes hundreds of years in one of the eras but you get down to the last one and I, I believe and uh, Mr. DeCampus mentioned it for those of you in the Bible study that he just finished on Revelation he said uh, I think it was the next to the last class that he actually thinks we are in the Laodicean era yeah. which I think anyone who believes in the earth would have to come to that conclusion because we're close to the end and it being the end. But it doesn't matter whether it's talking about seven churches. Some people believe that it also applies to seven church organizations effective uh, in existence right now at the end time. I didn't realize it until, I don't know, I guess it was looking at a week or so ago. Uh, I saw a sermon by me in, I think it was up in New York. And I listened to just a little bit of it, but I, I didn't listen to all the sermon. He said that along with the church eras, he said that there were seven eras in the Old Testament. I didn't really understand if he meant seven eras of mankind or if it was just the children of Israel. But it's interesting how people can assign eras, assign which church is Philadelphia, which one's Laodicea. And if you're into that, 
you're a lot more into something that I'm not that into. Because Christ said, if you've got ears to hear, I want you to hear what I said to all seven of the churches. I'd like to go now to the second thing that he said to the seven churches. So if you go back to Revelation chapter 2. I didn't follow my own advice and leave a mark there. In Revelation chapter 2 and in, in verse 2. To the church at Ephesus it says, I know your works. It's interesting. One of the lines in the sermon it was talking about works. We look down in verse 9. I know your works. Now, I said it's important that it's said seven times. Uh, some Bibles don't have works here in verse 9. Uh, the Bible is made from the Alexandrian text are different in these two ver in two of the verses here. They don't include works. I'm reading from the King James, and it says there in verse 9, I know your works. In verse 13, I know your works. And again, in the Alexandrian text, it's the word works is admitted those two times, but it still appears five times even in those texts. So five times it still makes it important. Then in verse 13, I know your works. Down in verse 19, I know your works. Over in chapter 3 in verse 1, about halfway through the first verse, he says, I know your works. In verse 8, I know your works. And then down in verse 15, I know your works. To each one of the churches, he said, I know your works. Now, we've been accused of being a church that believes in salvation by works and nothing to be further from the truth. But works are an important thing. We're judged by our works. Of course, the word works in the Greek is ergon, the word we get ergonomic, such the terms from. And it means an act or a deed, a labor or a work. It's just what you do. Now, our calling has absolutely nothing to do with any works that we've done or that we will do. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let me just look at this real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. Second Timothy 1 9 says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace, which is given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So the works that we do have done in life before we come into the church have absolutely nothing to do with our calling. Some of us were probably pretty good. Some of you, I'll put it that way, were probably pretty good people before you came to church. I was a dirty, rotten scoundrel. I, I don't even want to talk about uh, some of the things I did when I was young and foolish. And by the way, I'm no longer young. Uh, but our calling has nothing to do with works, but works are important to us in the church. Turn over to Matthew chapter 16. We'll look at a few things talking about works. We'll find that there's two different kinds of works that we'll talk about. In Matthew 16, verse 27. <clears throat> For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and of his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. So we will be rewarded in the kingdom according to our works. Let's turn over to John chapter 5 and read a little bit more about works. John chapter 5. And we'll read verses 28 and 29. John 5, 28 says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. <clears throat> 
So if you've done good works, you'll be resurrected to life. If you keep doing evil works, you'll be <clears throat> resurrected to condemnation. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 6. It talks about the very foundation of our beliefs. Verse that many of you have committed to memory, I know. Hebrews chapter 6, and we're just going to read the first verse. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. What are dead works? Well, Romans 6, 23, we won't turn there, but we know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Dead works are those works that lead to death. That's what you get paid for. Sin, in other words. Let's turn over to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, and we'll start in verse 19. We have a list of dead works. Galatians 5 verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh, these are the works that lead to death, are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So these are the things that lead to death. They're the works that we want to avoid. There are some other works that we need to realize that are important too. They're found over in Matthew chapter 25. Turn over to Matthew 25. We just talked about the words that lead to death. There's also some good works that people do. Yeah. Matthew chapter 25. Again, verses that are familiar to us. We'll start in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on His throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd remember we heard christ was our good shepherd divides his sheep from the goats he will set the sheep on the right hand but the goats on the left then the king will say to those on his right hand come you blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world for i was hungry and you gave me food i was thirsty and you gave me drink i was a stranger and you took me in I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And immediately those people said, when did we see you in all these situations and do anything for you? We do things for each other. And we don't always realize that we're doing it for God. In verse 40, Christ said, or the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Now, a lot of us, well, he talked about feeding the hungry, visiting those in prison. A lot of people think, well, I don't do much. I don't know of any good works that I do. How many of you have signed a card out there to send to a person who's on the prayer list? How many of you have prayed for one of those people? Those are good works. And Christ recognizes those works. Uh, I, it amazes me sometimes when some people say, well, I don't really contribute or I don't feel like I do. You don't know what sometimes what your smile means to someone when they come in. You don't know what any of us have been through during the week. I've come in after having a rough week sometimes and somebody will give me a handshake or a hug enlighten my whole day and it means a lot the little things we do are the works that he's talking about here and he mentions the big things but he also accounts all the little things that each one of you do is good works now there's a sad part to this story here in matthew if we look down in verse 
41. He said, then he will say to those on the left hand, these are to the goats, the ones he rejected. Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now these are sent into the lake of fire, not because they did the evil works that we read back in Galatians, but he goes through the same works that he was talking to the others about. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. All those things that the others were praised for, he condemned these. And like I said, condemned them to the lake of fire just because they didn't do those things. It's summed up over in James chapter four. We won't turn over there, but if you, if you want to make a note of it, James chapter four, verse 17 says, he who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. So we need to remember that, brethren. It's not just the evil works that are listed there in Galatians that are bad, but failing to do the things that we know to do or that are good is also sin. So our works are important. It's important that we stop doing the works that we did before we came in contact with Jesus Christ. And it's important that we do the good works that he wants us to do now. Turn over to Matthew chapter 5, well, over here in Matthew, we just back up to 5. Another very familiar verse. Oh, I, think I, I think I wrote down the wrong scripture. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill. It's in... He talks about being a light in fourteen. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, fourteen. It says you are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor did they light a lamp and put it under a basket. You are the light of the world. That's what the good works show. And we're to show them, not so people will praise us, but that they'll see our Father and our brother Jesus Christ and see those works and, it, and give him the glory, not us. But we're to let our light shine. That's the good work that we're to do. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, verse 10. Talking about good works. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The reason we are called, made lights, are so that our good works will be seen by people. Not, <clears throat> and again, it's not to bring glory to us. <clears throat> it's to bring glory to our Father. Turn over to Revelation chapter 20, all the way to the back of the book. We'll read a little bit more about works. Revelation 20, and we'll read, just read verse 12 and 13. Revelation 12, uh, 20, 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. So we're in the end, brethren. We're all going to be judged by our works. We're not going to be given salvation because of our works, but we're going to be rewarded according to the works that we do. And if our works don't measure up, then we'll miss out on eternity forever, which as one of the lawyers in his commercial here locally says lately, talked about being injured permanently and it being forever. He said, forever's a long time. <laughs> I agree with him. It, it is quite a long time. So we've seen that we're told to 
if we have ears to hear to hear, one of the things we heard was, I know your works. Christ knows our works, brethren. So we have to be careful that we're busy doing the good works. Let's go back to chapter 2 of Revelation now and see the third thing that's said to all seven of the churches. Revelation chapter 2, and about halfway through verse 7, of course it starts out, he who has an ear, let him hear. The second sentence there says, To him who overcomes, I will give him to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So if you overcome, you get a reward. And that, as we read through these seven things of overcoming, pay attention to the rewards that are given to those who overcome. Down in verse 11, again about halfway through the verse, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. I think that's a wonderful to think about that when we're resurrected, we don't have to worry about the second death if we make it in the first resurrection. Then in verse 17, again about halfway through the verse, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Again, a wonderful blessing for him who overcomes. Then in verse 26, he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. As Mr. Burton mentioned, we're going to be kings and priests, and we're going to have power over the nations. Over in chapter 3 and verse 5, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Wonderful blessing to those who overcome. Down in verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. What a blessing, being a pillar in the temple of God. Then in verse 21, to him who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Wonderful blessings to those who overcome. What are we to overcome, brethren? I think there's three things that stand out most of all. Of course, the word overcome there is from the Greek word nikao. It means to conquer, to overcome, to prevail against, to get the victory. So let's see what it is we're to get the victory over. What are we to overcome? The first thing we have to overcome is our very own sinful nature. Turn over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we'll start in verse 7. We'll see that our sinful nature is something that we have to overcome. Romans 8, 7 says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh, or those who live according to the flesh and do the works of the flesh, cannot please God. Then in verse 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So the first thing we have to learn to overcome, brethren, is our own sinful nature. This carnal nature that we all possess. Let's look over in Ephesians. We'll read a little bit more about this in Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Ephesians 4 and verse 22. Paul speaking here and he says, That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God, to true, <clears throat> in true righteousness and holiness. 
So we have to overcome that old man that we are, that we were, our carnal nature. Just a few pages over in Colossians. Just four or five pages over probably. Colossians chapter 3. Read a little bit more about this carnal nature. Colossians 3 and verse 5. Therefore were put to death your members which are on the earth. And it lists some of the ones we read about. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. So we have to put to death our old man, the carnal nature that we all have. Another thing we have to overcome, and I'm sure this may have been the first one some of you thought of, let's turn over to 1 Peter. Another memory verse that many of us have committed to memory. 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll see something else that we have to overcome besides our carnal nature. 1 Peter chapter 5, and we'll start in verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. We have to overcome Satan, brethren. How can we do that? James tells us over in the book of James. Something that Peter mentioned there, and James repeats it in chapter 4 of James, verse 7. Peter told us to resist the devil. And James chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The devil wants sheep to follow him. And if you resist him, he'll flee from you. He wants those that are easy to take. We can't be easy for him to take. We have to resist him, and that's how we overcome him, brethren. Peter and James both told us, resist him. That's the key to overcoming Satan. The third thing we have to overcome, let's turn over to 1 John. We're not too far from 1 John. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John 5 and verse 4. For whatever is born of God and should be begotten of God overcomes the world. And this is a victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? We have to overcome this world, brethren. We're told back in Revelation chapter 18, we don't have to turn there. It's another very familiar verse. Verse 4 in chapter 18 of Revelation says, Come out of her, my people. He's talking about Babylon, this world. One of the best uh, explanations I've ever heard of Babylon was the rat race. It's so political, what? education, regardless of what aspect of our life. In this world, it's just a madhouse. Rat race. And yeah. it's safe way and we have to come out of it we have to overcome it sometimes it seems like it's impossible to do but we have to do that brethren turn over to john chapter 16 and let's read something really encouraging about overcoming the world john chapter 16 we'll just read the last verse there in chapter 16 john 16 33 says these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Christ has overcome this world, and it's up to us to do the same, to follow his example and not be part of this world, but to overcome it. We've been called and given ears to hear. We should hear the messages that he sent to these seven churches. First thing he said was, if you have ears to hear, hear. Then he told us that he knows our works. Hopefully he knows our he good works. And we're striving to live them. So? And the last thing is overcoming the three things that we mentioned. It's going to be all overcome. Our <laughs> sinful nature, Satan, and the world. That's all three of these things are important for us to overcome. Yeah.
These are three lessons that we need to take from the seven letters that were sent to the seven churches. I mentioned before the seventh church was Laodicea. This last era being the Laodicean era. He didn't say anything good about the Laodiceans. They were corrupt. And yet, he said something very encouraging to the Laodiceans. Let's turn over for the last time to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and let's read verse 20. I memorized this verse when I was about 10 years old at Baptist Youth Camp. Didn't understand it at all. I understand it a lot better now, I think. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'll give you a little lesson in Greek. The verb stand there is in the perfect tense. In English, we have past tense, present tense, and future tense. Depending on which Greek teacher you listen to, there's between six and nine tenses in the Greek. All of them don't have to do with time, like we refer to them in English. The perfect tense in Greek, you're familiar with it, you've heard about it a lot, I know, where it's written, it is written in Scripture. It means it was written, but it's still in effect. So that's the reason we say it as present tense. It is written. Stand here in verse 20 is in the perfect tense. So Christ stands. He stood there for the Laodicean church 2,000 years ago, and he's still standing. So let's keep that in mind. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Knock's in the present tense. The Greek present tense is best expressed as knocking. He's knocking. Does that, doesn't, sometimes it means just to knock, but it's easiest understood if you understand that he's saying, I'm standing knocking at the door. And again, I want you to remember that he's saying this to the Laodicean church, which is the bad one that nobody wants to be like, the ones that he had the most criticism of. If anyone hears my voice, you hear his voice calling you, you hear, understand his voice when you hear it, you recognize it's being his voice. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, every time I read that verse, or that part of the verse, I think of, when Peter was released from prison in the middle of the night and he went to the house where the disciples were and he was knocking on the door and the girl came to the door and she heard Peter's voice and she didn't open the door. She ran and told everybody Peter was there. Well, Christ says, I'm standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. The old King James says, I will come in and sup with him. I heard, heard a lot of people over the years talking about, well, Christ wants to come in and have a cup of coffee with you, sup in it. And it'd be great to have Christ come in and have a cup of coffee with you. But the word doesn't mean sup. It doesn't mean that. The Greek word is dekneo, and it means to have the main meal of the day. And we've got some friends here from up north, and the main meal of the day for them was dinner. They have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm just an old country boy from down in Georgia. We didn't have breakfast, lunch, and dinner when I was growing up. We had breakfast, dinner, and supper. Supper was the main meal of the day. And like I said, if you're from up north, you'll realize dinner is the main meal of the day. How much have you read and heard in your lifetime about the importance of having the main meal of the day with a family? Christ said he wants to come in and have the main meal of the day with you with each one of us, if we recognize his voice and open the door for him. Come in and talk about what kind of day we've had, the ups and downs, spend quality time with us. That's what Christ is offering the layout of sin, brother, the people that we all think are so bad. If he's offering it to them, how much is he going to offer it to those who are doing the good works, to those who are following him? To me, that's one of the most encouraging scriptures in all the Bible. Jesus Christ stands knocking right now.
Do you hear his voice? Have you opened the door? 